We are joined here today by Yat, chairman and co-founder of Animoca Brands. Yat, hello, sir. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for having me. I guess just to kind of kick it off casually, we're we're kind of curious, like, you know, what, what, what games have you been playing recently? Have you had time at all for, you know, mobile games, you know, PC, desktop? Are you back in Hong Kong now uh, playing those games? Uh, well, I've only, I've, I've only been back in Hong Kong for 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 a couple of days, really, uh, since I was sort of fly around a lot. But I do play games. Um, you know, so, I mean, outside of, you know, before I sort of talk about the stable games that I play for my Nemoka brands, obviously, uh, you know, titles like, you know, we like to try our own stuff. So I do play Red League, I do play Phantom Galaxies. I play gamey from a hyper-casual standpoint. It's actually quite good because on Telegram, I can basically share those games with my family and friends in a very hyper-casual way. That's kind of neat. Uh, but the other games that I play, particularly with my younger son, um, and, and this is the beautiful thing about gaming, is that no matter where you are in the world, you know, as long as you have a gaming laptop that's fast enough, uh, and you have a reasonable internet connection, uh, you can you can play games, and that's actually the way in which you can sort of virtually bond and connect. Right? Uh, no longer do you have to be in a physical place and you know play soccer with your boys. Sure, you can do that too. Uh, but now actually we can play online games together, and uh, and they're much better than me. So one of our favorites that um, we played um, sort of uh, before is um, is Apex Legends. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're so actually uh, my youngest son is uh, he's diamond ranked, so he's pretty good. Uh, so, so, so he basically carries us or carries me to be precise. Um, and I think actually that in itself is kind of a fun experience, right? Because really it's an environment where, you know, he's 13, um, but he was really very good, like, you know, years before. And in this world, he's better than me. He's stronger than me. He's more capable. It's like, like everything, right? Uh, and it kind of creates a different type of level set here in terms of that's your world. And I'm, I'm. I'm a guest in your world as opposed to maybe the physical world where, you know, at your age, you're still technically learning from me, right? And I'm supposed to guide you in this world. So, so actually we learn from each other and it creates a much more even playing field, uh, which I think is how we probably have, at least internally, we think that, you know, how I would like to have my relationships with my children in the future is, you know, one of peers and friends rather than sort of the classic patriarch sort of um, hierarchy setup, which is unfortunately kind of the relationship I have with uh, my mom, love her to death. But, you know, it's, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's, it's that generation where, you know, if she says, I do. <laughs> it's, it's a different, different type of uh, relationship that uh, I have with her than I have with my children. And I think gaming, uh, certainly in our world, has, has had a big impact in that. And uh, two quick questions there. One is, does your son let you play ranked with him? Or yes, is we ranked? play ranked. Really? No, we play ranked. We play rank, oh, and uh, uh, so I, you know, I, so the highest I ever got was like I think uh, uh, gold four. Um, so 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 you know so so it's 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 not, but I think he he so he does play with other people, and that's kind of when he's serious, right? Uh, but when we play together, you know, I am so me and my older uh, my older son and him sort of we squad up, and so they're, they're the better players, and I'm I'm the one basically who's who sort of sort of. Uh, you know, I typically play like Lifeline or like you know, yep. Newcastle, basically. Yeah, I was going to ask. I'm support, like, which, right? Which utility <laughs> character are you playing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I'm basically I'm the healer. Okay, so I'm, I'm running around and, and making <laughs> sure that wrong with being the healer, support right? No, no, right. Um, yeah. And uh, I think in some ways, uh, although you know, obviously, um, w when stuff happens and they usually um, uh, don't have nice things to say to me in terms of you know why do you do that and whatever, but uh, you know, it's part of the it's part of the the sport, shall we say. Yeah, and then we afterwards we we have food and we just laugh about it and and you know we don't do it often enough like just because of the fact that uh, during COVID we actually did play a lot just because we were home all the time or actually I was in the US and and my son was stuck in 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 Hong Kong and the only way we could connect was through video games and back then you know outside of Axie Infinity there were no playable Web three games at scale <laughs> so we ended up playing all these other games uh, but it was it was great it was actually a great great way to sort of bond and connect over different time zones. I was stuck in the US. For those who don't remember, I couldn't even go to Hong Kong because Hong Kong basically yeah. said, we don't want anyone to come here. Like, I don't care where you're from. I don't even care that your family's here. You are banned, right? That's it. And so for basically um, something like four or five months, I couldn't come home at all. And, and so how do I connect with my family? And so, so it was video games. Under the assumption that... Um the various different forms of ownership, whether that be asset agency over assets, uh, digital data ownership, 
um, autonomous IDs, uh, protocol ownership, governance, revenue share, etc. Under the assumption that they're not all created equal, which ones should be prioritized as a meaningful competitive advantage early on? First, um, let me talk a little bit about sort of uh, why we think, generally speaking, ownership is just so powerful and then how it sort of plays into everything around, you know, especially uh, Web3 gaming, but broadly speaking, the principle of sort of digital ownership, which, you know, Web3 and blockchain sort of underpins. Uh, first, you know, I think when you have ownership of anything, whether it's your actual self-sovereign identity or whether it's an NFT asset, uh, like a board ape, or whether it's a game asset, it allows you to basically create permissionless network effects on top of them. What, and, and the permissionless network effects actually is what gives it power. And sometimes we can't fully predict what that power is because it's the community, it's the network around you that says, oh, let me build something on top of that. Let me create an environment around that. Like the example I often put is, you know, if Fortnite actually was going to allow their skins to be NFTs, then we're going to have thousands, if not tens of thousands of game companies in the world that start incorporating those skins for the mere reason that they want to attract Fortnite customers into the game. So they add utility. But then you'll also have rich content emerge like Fortnite Fashion Week or a Fortnite racing game or, you know, a whole plethora around it. But what's interesting is that now suddenly ownership of these skins becomes a platform in itself, not going to the App Store or going to Steam. Just the fact that I can now reach tens of millions of customers who own something, I can now build a business around it. And we've kind of seen that in the sort of early days of summer DeFi, um, you know, DeFi summer and NFT space where people offered lending protocols or people offered other kinds of more financial products. But these are basically network effects on top of the ownership of assets. And people started building guilds around, you know, Axie Infinity initially. And that guild business was also a kind of network effect construction on top of the ownership of others because you could do that in a permissionless manner. Uh, so, so that's kind of the, the first principle around that. And then, then the second part that then happens is that it also allows through this ownership for communities to coalesce around, around them. And that's really what's so powerful. And, you know, in some funny way, the NFT collections have done a much better job of this than actually the games, uh, game part. I'll get to that shortly. Uh, but meaning that you basically build a very strong community around the ownership of NFTs, you know, whether this be Board Apes or whether this is Cool Cats or whether this is, you know, even ownership of land and things like Sandbox or Decentraland. You know, you create a community around that and a belonging uh, through the principle of that ownership. And then each have their own agency to maybe build businesses around if they want. Whether this is something physical, like, you know, a hamburger shop or a sort of whiskey brand which we've seen with Board Apes, or whether it's something virtual, like a game experience inside the sandbox or the, a different type of games. You're free to basically create all sorts of uh, network effects on top of them. And the reason why I think the NFT uh, sort of, let's call them the more NFT collections at the early days, uh, the PFPs have done better in that than the gaming ones, is that because in the traditional way of looking at games, games is the utility. And the assets in the game exist to support the utility of the game itself. The financial value was retained in the revenue generation of the game. So if you're a studio, you weren't interested in showing value to the asset. You were interested in how much revenue you make from the game. So the asset's purpose was basically to support the game. But in Web3, actually the purpose is really to support the assets and the game becomes a layer, one of many layers of experiences on top of the ownership of the assets. So it's flipped upside down. Right? So in terms of priority, therefore, I would say in the principle of Web3, what you own is the priority, not the game itself. Like meaning an example of I give a Fortnite is, you know, Fortnite, the first vessel of the ownership could be the game and I have those skins. But at the end, there will be thousands of games and other experiences on top of the ownership of these skins that actually may not actually make the original game the biggest game ever. It will make, however, the owners of Fortnite, um, of Fortnite skins, you know, basically appreciative. Uh, their value might increase, but their utility will definitely increase. And owning a skin now is the gateway to a thousand experience, ten thousand experience, whatever. And we see this in the physical world. For instance, if you know you buy a car today, with all the services that you can now do with a physical car is no longer just to take you from point A to point B. In fact, actually, you buy a car for a thousand other reasons that are provided by third parties, whether it's baby seats, leather seats, audio, you know, like uh, coloring, you know, driver services, like you know, all these additional network effects that have basically made the ownership of cars more valuable. 
Uh, but the fact that you can sort of use it to transport you is probably you know a given, but it is no longer the primary reason that you decide to buy one car versus the other car. And uh, if I could hop in, you you talk a lot about how communities kind of form around the NFTs, right? But you, you didn't really talk too much about how fungible tokens within that specific game, right? A community can mm. form around that. Uh, Absolutely. Can you maybe elaborate on, is it like yeah. the, the identity that you can form and curate using so, the NFT? Is it? So, so, so there's two parts, right? So the NFTs themselves um, is, a, is, an, is an identity layer. Uh, and the identity layer could be through the ownership of things. Uh, meaning I could have many NFTs and that forms who I am, right? And we do this in the physical world too. You know, we might wear sort of, you know, a sort of, you know, um, um, a sports jacket. Uh, you might be wearing Nike shoes. You may be wearing glasses of a certain brand. Uh, and that actually forms a part of your identity. And you kind of always wear the same thing or you wear a certain style. And over time, people know that's your style. That's who you are. You wear a black turtleneck or you wear jeans, right? That's the kind of guy that you are. And that's actually what NFTs represent as well. And through the ownership of these assets, you create an identity. But that's not fully say, saying what's, that's your name, but it forms a part of that, right? And then you have the other layer on top where you basically can start proving things about who you are, right? So it's a form of a status symbol, but it's also reputation. So ownership of NFTs or earning NFTs or earning skills-based NFTs, for instance, is a form of reputation. I'm a really good gamer. You know, I'm a diamond rank or a gold rank, right? I mean, these are other things that you can now own as these badges so that when you enter uh, sort of another gaming environment, you have two possibilities, uh, multiple actually, but here's two examples. One of them is to say, oh, you're a diamond rank player. So I'm going to give you a bonus to play my game because I want you, because I know that you're a really good gamer. And the other one, of course, is the network effect of the status, right? I mean, you know, it's like, oh, you're an authentic diamond rank player. I need your help. I'll pay you some money if you can help me. You know, like <laughs> you have these website platforms where they literally pay you to carry you in a game, right? Uh, which of course, technically speaking, is frowned upon. But, you know, it's a business because people desire the status. They desire the rank. Um, how they get there, if they can't do it through skill, they'll get there through the money, which is what we do in the physical world. Um, and then talking a little bit about fungible tokens. You know, it's actually, you know, not just a non-fungible. They themselves actually form a part of the community. And you can see this in things like meme coins. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of things about meme coins. You can sort of say, my goodness, it has no value. What does it all mean? But what a meme is, is culture. And culture basically is the thing that binds and glues together communities, uh, whether it's fun, frivolous, you know, whimsical, or maybe serious. But either way, you know, we attach value to concepts that sort of bind us together through a shared reality, which is a community. And, you know, when you think about, for instance, things like movements, like, like the green movement or the conservation movement, you know, for the vast majority of people in those movements, they don't actually have a value in and of itself. It's not like they, 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 they buy things that are maybe conservation friendly or that is green, right? They're, they're sort of supporting them. And they're then shared in a community of people um, where like, oh, you're like, you care about this, right? Or you care about, you know, um, you care about sort of, you know, saving animals, right? And so you form a community around that and you form a kinship around that. And that becomes basically your reality. And that's a, that's a shared culture. And what tokenization simply does you know, financial, financial aspect aside, is it binds people together in a decentralized manner where you can then basically exchange each other's certainty of, oh, you're, you're a member like me, right? Whether this is an NFT collection like, you know, Board Able Mochaverse, or whether this is a sort of fungible token that is literally, you know, um, uh, sort of, you know, very, sort of just, just you know, non-fungible, I'm sort of fungible, but basically you, you have, you know, millions of people that coalesce around the ownership of the token to say, I believe in this message. Uh, and, you know, I mean, in some ways you could say the early days of Bitcoin was very much around a certain kind of community that came together, built around a belief system. I'm so happy you brought up community and culture. That kind of leads me into the next kind of spot I wanted to pick your brain on. So in a recent talk, you mentioned, and I'm paraphrasing here, so uh, don't kill me if I butcher it, but you mentioned in both the real world and the metaverse, we buy things because we want to own something that is part of the culture part of the community that we identify with and utility becomes a secondary concern. So paraphrasing a little bit further, community and culture can take precedence over utility. And this is realized in NFTs. So I'm curious when you're kind of building out an Amoka, the Mochaverse, et cetera, how do you evaluate community and culture for potential partnerships? So first, you know, I think some one, one important thing that we certainly think about a lot is 
we think of everything we're building in Web3 in terms of economies, right? So almost like sort of sort of mini nations or maybe bigger nations eventually in, in due course. And when we look at sort of what is it that we spend most of our time with and what are we spending on is we're actually spending it on culture predominantly, right? If you actually even think of everything you're doing, like even food in my mind is culture uh, because, you know, you could just have, you know, I mean, you could just have, I mean, fast food is a culture, right? Uh, so it may seem cheap, but there's a kind of culture attached to enjoying fast food, enjoying McDonald's or, or sort of, you know, um, sort of Burger King type of stuff. Or if you go to a fine dining experience, that's also a kind of culture, mm. but they're tied together and they form again, again, a kind of community around that. So everything is really culture, whether it's consumptive or whether it's one that you can own. Um, and we sort of the thing I often tell people in sort of Web3 terms is that culture is the deepest TVL of any economy. If you actually don't have culture in an economy, you don't have investment. You don't, and, and, and when you think of investment, you don't only think of investment in terms of, oh, what kind of capital return is it? I mean, that's one angle, but really you're investing in yourself, right? Whether you're sort of studying, whether you're basically dressing yourself up, whether you're buying certain shoes, whether you're buying a Rolex, for instance, uh, or something of status, right? You actually buy them to invest in yourself or in your own image for a projection of a future that you are in or in one that you desire. Uh, and, you know, I mean, people don't buy a Rolex to tell the time. And the example I gave in the TED Talk was people don't buy a Birkin bag to put stuff in it, right? Because you can get, uh, you know, a much cheaper bag to do that. But when you walk around, you're saying something about yourself and, and you're, 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 you, you, you don't just feel good. You actually become a member, even if it's an invisible member of a certain type of, uh, certain type of community. So I think, I think that's a really, really critical component of sort of um, building out any kind of you know, metaverse. So in Web3, when we think about things like the Mochaverse, we first think about what's the mission? What's the story? What's the culture we want to build upon, right? And unlike, uh, sometimes cultures form automatically because we can't control the community, right? They take you into a journey. Many of the early NFT projects have gone through that. I, I'm pretty sure that the Board Apes community didn't start off uh, sort of thinking that they're going to be what they became, for instance. They may have had a vision, but because it's community owned, and see, that's the power of you know, this sort of stakeholder model is that actually you may have a vision where it goes, but the community will drive you there because they become your owners and they say, I want this, right? Which is, you know, um, you know, sometimes it's for the, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's for the better in the sense that they actually, you know, you have the direct feedback as opposed to, I have a vision for the product and that's exactly what's going to go. And I don't really care what you say. I'm just going to go do that. That works sometimes, but I would say it's much easier to build a product where the community gives you, gives you direct feedback. But you can still embed it with a, a mission. So in Mochaverse, you know, we have a very clear uh, sort of mission in terms of building something that is reflective of Web3, reflective of the spirit of shared value or sh sort of sharing in the network effect. And so we've created these realms around builders and angels and so on. Um, and so we're trying to sort of invite people in the community. And so when, when you're building a, a community this way, you're thinking around, okay, who are the people that we should market it to? Who are the people that we should bring in? And hopefully you can build that network around, right? When you, when you, when you, for instance, building a health, health related product or fitness related product, it's the same thing. You know, you might think of it as marketing, but what you're really doing is appealing to the core community that you're building for that is mission aligned to whatever it is that you're, you're putting forward. So I don't think it's that different. It's just that uh, you're able to communicate more directly with them. The feedback is, you know, it's not like above the line marketing. I don't really know who you are. So I have sort of mass analysis. Like you can literally go to the thousand true fans and they'll talk to you, <laughs> you know, and, and they'll tell you everything that's on their mind. And, uh, so, and I think that's the power of Web3. So when you're kind of trying to, when you're trying to quantify the TVL of the community, you, I mean, you, you kind of alluded to this at the end of the, at the end, of, end of your answer, where you kind of go and you just chat with the community. Like, is, is that kind of how you really get a feel for, you know, what the, the raw community looks like in the early stages when you're evaluating potential partnerships or um, like, so so there's two, I guess, as I was saying, uh, the kind of two approaches. One of them is you put up an NFT collection and you basically have a mission and then you let the community guide it entirely based on who actually ends up um, sort of participating. In it. And it, it has sort of pros and cons. The pro is that basically you let them guide you and you go in a situation. The con is that if there's a certain kind of community, and I think particularly in, in, in during the bull run that's happened a lot, is a community that took over was very, very financially motivated. 
And so that meant that your community became primarily speculators, which is what many NFT projects had in the, in the early days. Unintentionally so. It wasn't necessarily their vision, but it just ended up being the case because there was money to be made. And then you ended up having to build a certain kind of culture that maybe wasn't aligned with the company that was trying to build that, right? So, so whereas there are some um, sort of, whether it's a token or non-fungible token, you know, that is, that's aside, it's the culture. If their culture is around money, right, which is some cultures do that, um, then they are quite aligned uh, within the community that they built in. And they see success because their values and that of the community come together, right? Um, and so they're able to build power around that because they understand them, they get them, and they build products and services that appeal to them. Uh, you know, so that's kind of one example. But if you are very intentional, uh, which is kind of more our lens, and say, look, for instance, with Open Campus, with EDU, we are very intentional about building sort of an education and learning community. We know that learning community is not the dominant community in Web3 today, right? We get that, right? So we're trying to build it. And that means we have to be intentional about it, which means we have to seek partnerships with schools and universities and learning institutions, or most recently with Pinkfong, the creators of Baby Shark, right? I mean, and, and again, from the outside lens of perhaps people who are, you know, looking at a money culture, they're like, what's this? I don't get it, right? But from the lens of building something out, actually that, uh, that is intentional, that makes sense because we're trying to appeal to that community because part of our mission is also mass onboarding. So for instance, look at Sandbox. You know, I would say that the culture of Sandbox was on one hand virtual land ownership, but also sort of metaverse gaming in, a, in the spirit of Roblox and Minecraft. And that was something that was very easy to appeal to that group of people because they understood it. They're like, oh, I get it. I want to be able to play Minecraft, but I want to own my stuff for the first time ever. And that's Sandbox. Okay. So, so that was not just something that had an, an apparent product market fit uh, in the early days from a messaging standpoint. It was also a Sort of, they stuck to those. They stuck to that mission. Um, they didn't. They didn't. Even if the community in the beginning might have appeared to be more speculative, all the partnerships that Sandbox built was around gaming culture, creator culture, builder culture, and you know, I think Sandbox today has perhaps one of the highest and deepest concentration of that culture over the years in which it's built it, uh, which has basically become an intentional culture that was built um, around that. So it's. It, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. It's more like sort of what it is that you're doing, but I would say that you have to build a product and service um, in, the in any space that is aligned to your values, right? If your values aren't aligned to what you're building, it's really hard to serve your customer, right? It's really difficult to do something that you're just like, let's say you're against it, right? You're just like, oh, I, I don't, I want to do this. <laughs> Why are you even going to work, right? Yeah. yeah. I want to quickly double tap on that last point just to see, so, at this, we're obviously still early and a lot of uh, projects are experimenting with the perfect way to kind of build this community culture with uh, the aid of blockchain assets. Um, but we, we certainly have enough case studies now, um, many of which you are either directly or indirectly involved with, to name a few. There's the Sandbox, Meme Land, I think Ronin are all good examples. Yuga Labs as well are all good examples of projects that have um, done a really good job in cultivating that culture. Um, and in many of many of these cases, they've the blockchain assets used within the, the ecosystem have aided in that community growth. Um, that said, I think there's still a lot of confusion from builders as to exactly when and how to deploy blockchain assets in in search of that, like building a culture. And seeing as you're kind of in the process of doing that now yourself, um, I'm wondering, like, what insights could you share as to whether or not there is, can there be a calculated approach to this? Or is it partly chance, a lot of passion and uh, good timing. You are intentional in your setup. You prepare for it. You, you have a vision and you work towards that. But then there is chance, as there is in life, right? And something happens and you're ready for it and you can take advantage of it. Uh, and, and, that, and, and, and that to me is really, when you think about just generally investing space uh, in technology has always been the case. And I think the probability is much higher in technology because network effects construct more automatically um, than they do in the traditional way, right? So in the traditional way, you have many gateways, whether it's distribution, like you have to work with Walmart, 
or whether it's uh, you know you know sort of a gated uh, platform controls in terms of real estate, for instance. Oh, I want to open a supermarket, but I got to work with a real estate agent. Actually, you know where you ended up having distribution points were actually the ones that you know you had controls because they're the ones who controlled effectively the the network effects, right? You know, shopping malls or whatever those those constructs were in the physical world that limited that. They were the gateways. Uh, and in Web two, these gateways started to sort of form back again in the form of Apple and Google and Steam and Amazon, right? So we, we went back to these gated communities. Uh, but in Web three, everything is actually quite wide open, uh, meaning that when you basically build a community and you're preparing for it with a vision, maybe the vision you ended up building is not the one that you thought, but a new or maybe actually the way I see it, multiples of doors open up because a community enters and you have thousand network effects built on them. So meaning every customer isn't a consumer. Every customer is a node that has the potential to expand the network freely. That's a very powerful paradigm. Like if you're a user in the app store, you're not a node until you're a developer. Until then, you're really a user. Yeah, you're promoting it, but you're really just a user. You don't have a way to fully contribute into the network. But in Web3, just owning an NFT freely, having the ownership makes you more than, it's a stakeholder, but you have an economic incentive now to basically, so you have an in incentive to sort of, uh, sort of show value and you have resources to build on top of it that accrue as an investment into your product, right? So for instance, if you're, um, you know, one of, when people think about building neighborhoods, right? They want people to have ownership because they want people to invest in it, right? And they want people to grow that, right? It's very bad to have someone who owns a piece of property and it's empty, right? <laughs> There's nothing in there. It basically just hollows out communities because there's nobody there, right? And, 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 and that comes from, you know, and, and that, that kind of spirit, you want to create communities that are lively, that are actionable, that's what you have to foster. But then they build stuff for you that you could never imagine. I mean, Board Apes has a made for Apes program now, but when they put out the licensing model, they had a, a vision, but, you know, like no idea that there's going to be whiskey brands and there's going to be like alcohol and that kind of stuff emerge and create these network effects, right? Um, or, you know, did we think that in Sandbox, we're, you know, we're going to have, you know, financial institutions like HSBC and Standard Chartered and those guys and, and DBS Bank build in the sandbox? I mean, not really, right? Because that's like saying, oh, HSBC is going to build an experience in Minecraft. That doesn't seem obvious at all. But they saw something that we didn't think of at the time, which is, oh, these are crypto users and they have half a million to a million dollars of value. If I'm a landowner and I own virtual real estate, I'm a potentially good customer. And these kind of network effects come from the imagination and creativity of people outside of our industry who then basically are able to sort of spot something that we can't, right? And, you know, that's also the reason why open source, for instance, is now the sort of unbeatable sort of, I guess, coding platform in terms of being able to sort of build and share code, even though it's a barter system, there's no true value exchange because you cannot compete with the millions of coders and the network effects they build on top of code mm. than any centralized system in the world because you can't hire a million coders. You can hire maybe tens of thousands of coders but that's about it, right? Then you're stuck, right? And now open source is the, the, the dominant um, sort of um, um, code sharing platform in the world. Um, and now essentially with Web3, you can even share that value across. So, so I think to me, you know, it's, uh, it's, kind, of, um, it's kind of inevitable. I, if we could kind of go to one point that you hit on there, you were talking about ownership. And to me, it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, your, your definition of ownership kind of comprises of elements like, economical freedoms, um, network effect particip participation, self-expression. I'm curious, like which of these, these three elements, maybe there's more, do you think is, is the strongest or predominant driving force behind you know, scaling you know, a protocol, a project, a game in Web3? And it, maybe mm -hmm. it's you know, in the early phases, it's one, and maybe it starts off with you know, self-expression. And then as that kind of grows, it turns into maybe economical freedoms once there's some like tangible value attributed to that asset. And then as that grows, people start to rally a community behind it. Um, just kind of curious what you think about, you know, if my definition's right, uh, if you'd add anything sure. to that equation or, you know, how you kind so of dissect it. I would say the, the predominant sort of theme across true ownership is to us the freedom to transact. How you transact is almost irrelevant, right? Um, meaning you could transact for value, or you could transact entirely for your own identity. You could transact something that is maybe socialist in construct, like you could just share, right? Who cares, right? Like you, nobody said that. Nobody said that you must make money from this. This is 
I think a narrative that has sort of gone a little bit wrong in the early days because there was so much money involved. And I think the people who were engaged in the early form of web three culture, uh, you know, was more Wall Street in nature, uh, which I think is changing. But you know, was was sort of the narrative, and that's why people sort of were turned off for it uh, um, because. In the same way that people are turned off by sort of what's happening in Wall Street itself, not to say that it's wrong, but there's for some people that just feels like they don't understand it and, and it's all about money and it's just not their share culture, right? It's not something that, you know, most people in the world um, look at money as a means to an end, not an end in and of itself. But for certain people, money is the end, right? And that is something that a certain community was more dominant in the early days of crypto. Uh, and that's why it's become sort of people think of it as sort of, you know, freedom to transact must mean freedom, must mean economical value per se. But no, that's not what we mean. We just mean the freedom to do whatever you want with it. And the fact that you have value, the fact that you could earn potentially, is just one node. It's just one effect that you could have when you have the full freedom to transact. The permissionless nature of that freedom is what's critical. Because freedom to transact also means that I can now build a business on top of it, or I can give you a service and I only have to work with you, the owner of the asset, to have permission to do it. I do not have to talk to another central authority that sort of has a way, uh, has, has, has sort of dominion over your so-called assets. I mean, imagine if, you know, Tesla had a terms of service in their car um, and, you know, you can drive the car, but any changes and modifications and services you add to it, got to seek permission or at least pay a 10 or 20 percent service charge. Um, that means I couldn't hire a driver. I couldn't change the tires. I couldn't, uh, and you know, in the early days, even Apple tried to do that, right? Apple was like, oh, you have to use a charger? Mm -hmm. Got to use the Apple charger. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want to use headphones? You got to use the Apple headphones. Uh, and then eventually they were actually, even cases, they even disliked cases in the early days. They're like, no, we don't want cases. That's not what it's designed for. And now, you know what? They've, they've, they've given in because actually the fact that you can have cases, the fact that you can choose from a hundred different headphones, the fact that you can have all these accessories on the iPhone, is actually why people are buying iPhones. Like I know friends who are like, I want to buy a phone, but iPhone has the best cases. So I'm going to buy an iPhone, right? Because I can decorate it in a way that I can't do with all these Androids that have different form factors and shapes, for instance. And while that might not be the majority of users, it's a big part of a community that basically Apple can no longer lose, right? I mean, Apple can no longer, you know, if Apple actually somehow made a policy to ban cases, it would be an outcry. Nobody would be okay with that, right? So, so that's, um, that's basically uh, what the freedom to transact means to us. And the economic side is really just one point. So it, it sounds like freedom tra to transact is a bit of like this umbrella term. And then maybe yes. there are different archetypes of users that might define that term in different ways. So if you're thinking about this from, let's say, like a net new project, right? And you're going to other communities, is the idea that you want to find a specific type of user that defines that freedom to transact in a similar way. And then you build up maybe that golden cohort and then you go from there. Or is the idea that, hey, maybe there's an ideal composition of users that each define freedom to transact differently. And this kind of diverse, you know, uh, whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it, economy, yes. group of users, et cetera, actually will be the most robust composition for that 1,000 true fans. So I think the thousand true fans, sort of, uh, I guess, adage, um, and whether it's a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand, obviously that number varies, but sort of the thousand true fans principle, I think is the one that we typically would recommend because it's something that you as a community builder can have oversight over, right? If you bring in a million people and you're trying to sort of manage multiple communities at the same time, actually there'll be tensions that you have difficulties analyzing and knowing what that is. And so for instance, in gaming communities, it's fairly straightforward because in gaming, the game that you design from a gameplay standpoint, um, is the appeal? Is it a first-person shooter? Is it an RPG? Is it an adventure game? Is it a strategy game? Is it an RTS? Like these are things that already begin to bring in your initial fan base, right? But you don't make money from the gameplay. You make money from the meta, right? You make money from sort of you know the chests and the and actually the meta aspect of how you make money in the game is fairly similar from the RPG to the first-person shooter to whatever, right? So the mechanism doesn't change. It's more about sort of, I want to find someone who's into World War II games, or I want to find someone who's into history games, or into slashers, or into horror, right? And that's how you build your community, and that becomes essentially your core cohort. Uh, and while it's kind of an oversimplification, right, if you, you know, since we're talking about gaming, if you talk about sort of the, sort of the, the age-old Bartle taxonomy of player types, which is kind of a quasi-player archetype, uh, you can kind of say that, 
you know, uh, you take away the socializers. To me, the socializers, which is the majority of the gamers, are the ones that are pulled in by the core gamers. Uh, and the core gamers is your core community, your thousand true fans, right? And I think the numbers were something like roughly 10% for the achievers and the explorers, you know, 1% for the killers. So those guys are totally antisocial, right? You can't play with those guys. <laughs> they're just they're, 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 So forget those, right? But the achievers and the explorers, they're the ones who are, you know, in the Bartle model, are actually the ones that pull in the community. And they, but they play the games for different reasons, right? Either they play the game because they want to explore and expand, or they play the game because they want to rank and they have status, they want to be diamond, or they want to be gold, you know? And that to me is essentially in, in a, a certain game type, the same that we're building in communities, where we build a core community, they become your base. In the sandbox, it was the creators. The creators were the core base. They're the ones who were your biggest fans. They brought in the customers. They created community. You know, like Snoop Dogg is a great creator and he brought in his community and all the rest of the socializers basically came into the sandbox experience because, you know, uh, Snoop was, was, was there in the Achiever Explorer type of model uh, and, and many other, other experiences uh, that were built around that, right? So it's an oversimplification, obviously, of archetypes, but I think it's a good high level since we're talking about gaming and I think most game designers would be very familiar with uh, Bartle's taxonomy. It's going to be, it's going to be really interesting when we have um, decentralized ID protocols so that identifying those types of, uh, of users becomes slightly easier or n not just identifying them. Cause I think we can already do that to a certain extent, but um, being able to attract them, you know, with, with certain incentives that like are very personal to them. Well, I mean, that's what we're now building with Mochaverse with the Mocha ID. Yeah. And the idea between the Mochaverse and the Mocha ID was to create a completely decentralized ID system that is, you know, from a zero knowledge standpoint, you don't have to know the names, you just, but you are able to identify certain things around them where you can then basically offer services to them. And what it also allows you to do is for people to build platforms on top of that ID system because it's actually self sovereign owned by the end user. So, in other words, instead of having a Steam experience where I have to go to Steam, to experience that, and, and they all know everything about you. You could have five different versions of Steam, right? You could have a Steam that's only focused perhaps on certain type of gamers, or you could have uh, a, a sort of Steam experience that basically caters towards a certain different setup. And they're free to do that because the sort of um, the ID system, which is the soulbound token in this case, uh, is one that's freely composable to whoever wants to participate in the usage of it. Um, and one of the easiest examples for us is why we started thinking about this early days is KYC. Because KYC was something that, you know, we had to sort of redo for every game we launch. And, you know, not only does it cost money, there's a wallet um, that then ends, get, ends up getting traded. I mean, you know, in our Rec League, um, Rec League launch, um, you know, we had like 30 or 40,000 wallets that ended up having sort of different email addresses from places that were like, wait a second, how'd that happen? And it turns out that, you know, many of them were <laughs> signing up accounts somewhere in Pakistan which would pass KYC and then they'd sell it off to some other place, right? Because wallets are essentially very tradable uh, as opposed to Sobon IDs. So again, so, so you know, these are, these are all parts of the evolution of the space that basically makes it better and easier. And then once you have a KYC ID, someone else can use it because they no longer have to re-KYC and they can save money around uh, the fact that they don't no longer have to do that uh, again and again and again. Yeah. And I believe Mocha ID is, is live now. So anyone listening should started. go and sign up. Correct. Yeah. Yes. It's free. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, it has been a pleasure. Um, Thank some you. really cool answers. Uh, and some like insights that fall outside of like the sort of the typical uh, conference speech, which is which is what we try to aim for. So appreciate that as well. Thank you so much for your time and for having me. Yeah. The content of this video is intended for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. The views shared by Alex and I are our own, and we may hold investments in some of the companies or digital assets featured in the video.